Okay, my English teacher friends. So in this video, I want to showcase uh, another one of my alternatives to traditional grading. So I know it's we're coming upon test prep season and we're going to be under the deluge and avalanche of uh, essays and papers to grade. So hopefully I can um, make life a little easier for everybody. Um, and uh, I'll show you a couple of tricks that I use to save myself from... Uh, having my evenings and weekends consumed. So let me jump right in. So I'll give you a little bit of background information on, on how and why I came up with these alternatives to traditional grading. So <clears throat> early in my year, in my career, um, you know, I kind of had a snarky little epiphany and I said, you know, why is it that <clears throat> English teachers or like it's like one of the only professions where we have so much compulsory unpaid overtime and uh you know i had a i had a little child at the time first year teacher and i was like all my evenings and weekends are being consumed by grading and then i load all these comments on my students paper and i see little to no growth or maturation in their ability to write from subsequent draft to subsequent essay and in my teaching practicums i i uh, my mentor teacher was theodore sizer uh at uh at brown university and um you know we, we we talked about this during my my student teaching i just said this seems really ineffective time consuming cumbersome yet it's the only paradigm that we have available to us like we've been doing this since the one room schoolhouse and for me, it just seemed extremely futile and uh, um, just mind numbing to do. And if you think about it, 99% of the onus is put on the teacher in terms of getting a student to mature and grow as a writer. So let's say, for example, we've spent four weeks going over Lord of the Flies with our sophomores. And then we say, okay, it's time to write. We're going to write the essay. And you take a couple of periods to, uh, to get it done. Student submits it. And typically, you know, we sit on it for a while. The essay um, takes us a couple of weeks. And we take our evenings and our weekends and we load it with comments, you know, put little editorial hen tracks on it, uh, put a little summative paragraph at the end and slap a grade on it. We've done, by virtue of that, 99.9% .9 of the heavy lifting. What's the student's responsibility? They get the essay back. Most of them don't even read our comments. We have to acknowledge that. So that's, that's like a very sad existential feeling that we spent so much of our lives, uh, you know, doing that work and they don't, they don't even honor it. Uh, you know, they look at the grade and I know for a lot of my students, they're like, yeah, I got a 96. Awesome. I love this class. Or I got a 72. Coon must hate me. Right. They internalize it very personally as if I have, you know, some vendetta against them. So I get that a lot. So, you know, in, in my practicum, we always learned that, you know, in order for learning to occur, that uh, ratio of onus needs to be more, more, you know, equally distributed and teeter-totter balanced. So I've come up with, um, God, at least 40 alternatives to traditional grading at this stage of my career. Seldom will um, I use the old paradigm to grade. And I find that, um, you know, I'm creating a lot of really good writers. You know, I'm cranking cranking a, lo a lot of really good writers, and my students learn a lot about composition with an alternative method versus the traditional uh, paradigm. So hopefully um, you guys find these to be useful and liberating. You know, it's a, who, who doesn't want their evenings and weekends back? And, you know, as teachers, you know, we all want our students to, uh, you know, grow and mature and flourish as uh, readers and writers. So it's just a way to think outside of the box and uh, take a different approach because we know that, um, you know, what we are doing is flawed to some extent. So here's the kicker, though, it, before we uh, take a look at this particular um, uh, alternative. You got to equip your students with templates. And for those of you that are familiar with my work, um, you know that I always 
uh, embrace a couple of templates that I've honed over my career. For the introduction, we either declare or invert the thesis, and there are like set rules and guidelines and parameters for how that template is to be manipulated by the student uh, in terms of capturing their thesis. And then for the body paragraphs, we rock out with the syllogistic method every single essay, no matter the expository mode, no matter the genre. So when you're using templates, you as the grader, the reader, um, can get real deliberate and exact in terms of what you're looking for, um, in terms of like how the student, um, you know, proceeds through the establishment of their line of reasoning, uh, just compositional nuance things, basics, grammar, punctuation, syntax, all those things we look at, you know, you can get really focused on instead of looking at the totality of, of something. And then the second kicker, and I always emphasize this, is that you got to Bob Ross your instruction. And here's, here's what I mean by that for those of you that uh, are new to my methods. So when I work with teachers, I always explain that there's a fundamental difference between the assigning of writing and the explicit teaching of it. So let's say, for example, um, my juniors have finished Macbeth. And I say, all right, we got to write an essay. You know, where our, our end unit assessment is going to be a literary analysis. Here's a graphic organizer, fill it out. And then you have two whole periods to get the essay. You know, it's due Thursday at the end of the block. I just assigned, you know, it's kind of closely akin to this. And, you know, I was thinking Bob Ross is, is, is probably one of the, the better teachers I've ever seen. So he'll come on screen and say something like, Hello, happy little people. Today we're going to paint a beautiful New England autumnal landscape with beautiful fall foliage. And in the center of our canvas, we're going to include a New England wood covered bridge. Oftentimes in composition, we say, you know, write it, do it, paint it, and give no exemplars and models. Or we say, here's a graphic organizer, uh, fill it out, and then execute. And Bob sits there and paints deliberately through the piece giving us countless exemplars and models and even though you know he's expert he's the best we can approximate what he's doing and closely resemble um, what he produces even if we are the most inept of painters and if we practice 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 we can get pretty good at it and the same goes for composition so i get to the easel i get to the canvas with my students and say, all right, we're doing rhetorical analysis, so therefore we know we have to declare the thesis. Here's three examples, and I talk through them. And then I say, all right, you've seen it three times, go. You do it on your own. And it demystifies the writing process. You know, and the, you know, the other thing with Bob Ross is that he only used one template. He called it a heuristic, the wet on wet technique. Every single time he painted, he used the exact same template. And the same goes for, you know, my writing when I write with my students and um, yeah, just, you know, follow the template. So you're the expert writer in the classroom. Don't forget that. Give your kids plenty of exemplars and models and they should flourish. So as always, um, you know, I ask this question to my students and my, and, and, and my teachers. How do you construct the introductory paragraph? So let's say for the example of just demonstrating how to manipulate this uh, alternative grading method that we're doing um, a rhetorical analysis of uh, FRQ2 2020 Lady Bird Johnson, you know, from the AP language exam. And I know some of you don't use, you don't, don't teach a lang, but just bear with me for example. So we know for rhetorical analysis that we have to declare the thesis. So students will write their essays, submit them, and um, you know, I proceed like this during 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 the the writing workshop. You know, I'll just go over things and say, all right, let's let's review this. You know that you had to declare the thesis. So you got to begin with the thesis. I want to see some tier two level vocabulary in there. So COPPA academic diction. So your average run of the mill SAT level words should be in there every now and then. Flesh it out with context background. Focus on those sentence constructs for voice rhythm and flow. And the introduction is going to be exactly four sentences long. 
So I'll skip the, that's just the opposite, the inverted you use for literary analysis. And then for uh, argument, synthesis, persuasion, research, it's a 50-50 flip between the declarative and inverted. Students have, you know, choice on that depending on how the prompt is worded. So if we are to um, uh, take a look at FRQ2 2020, Lady Bird Johnson, um, you know, in terms of like honing in my lens and my focus for grading these, implicit in every prompt, and you've heard me say this in every single video I've ever made, you have two implicit questions in the prompt. What is the authorial intent and how does the author construct meaning? The student really needs to answer both of those questions in the introductory paragraph to have a clearly articulated dynamic, you know, like vociferous uh, dynamic thesis statement because that's at the crux of uh, uh, rhetorical analysis. So for the purposes of performing rhetorical analysis, I have my guys declare the thesis. And in terms of articulating that thesis, I tell them that when they read a passage, they should find the three most salient terms and or devices in the piece and weave those three together uh, to get anchored in the thesis. So with regards to the Lady Bird Johnson piece, my students are going to kind of pick from this list here. These are the high flyers. And it's not an exhaustive list, but these are the high flyers. These are the, these are the terms that keep coming over and over and over again with all of our practice material. So in terms of doing um, the Bob Barker's uh, blank check, uh, this is how I structure the writing workshop. I first read all the student essays. I just read them. And I don't put any comments on them. Uh, I don't even lift up a pen. I just read. And then on a notebook, I write down the grade I would give it. And I don't show it to the kids. Right? So they come in the next day. And um, we do the, the Bob Barker's blank check writing workshop. And they have checks that I give them. So I made, I made these checks on Canva that they're going to fill out. So they have their essay and they have these blank checks. And what I've done is I've anonymously taken um, student writing and we're going we're gonna to break it down together as a class and have a class discussion about um, just nitty gritty compositional things. So we work on a scale of, uh, you know, 100 to 50 for grades. We don't do A, B, C, D, F at my school. Uh, and even with like AP scores, we need to we need to convert it to a numerical score for our grade books. So I'll take a hundred essay and um, we make it the hundred dollar essay, a 90 essay, $90, $80 essay. And then I write the 70 so as not to embarrass uh, any any student. I don't want to throw anyone under the bus. And we go bit by bit, element by element through the template. So we look at introductions first, right? We'll look at the 100, the 90, the 80, the 70. The students are going to be comparing their work to this gradation, right? And the goal is for them to see, like, how does their, how does their introduction align with the 100, the 90, the 80, the 70? So I'm expecting a kid to be self-critical enough to say, you know, I got some glitches and some pitfalls and some snafus going on in my writing. You know, my introduction looks most like, you know, the 80. And here's exactly what I can do to fix it. That's onus of responsibility where the student can make that epiphany, you know, where they can illumine their own light bulb and say, I know definitively what I need to do. Uh, to improve my writing. So I'm a big proponent of see a lot of writing, show kids a lot of writing. They need to read uh, each other's writing a lot um, to get a sense of the good, the bad, the ugly. So I just, I go in random order, right? So I don't go 100, 90, 80, 70. I'll just, you know, I, I might start with the 80 and then go to the 100, 90, 70 and have the kids talk through 
and assign the point value to them and they can figure it out right so i'll just give you I'll just give you a couple of, uh, of 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 examples here so through a reverent and lauding tone lady bird johnson offers an address in which she honors the life and accomplishments of eleanor roosevelt so one of the things that um, we talk about is if you're declaring lead with the most salient term the most relevant term and that's what this kid did here they're asserting that the tone is most important and within my template when my students identify tone i tell them to go with two tone words and that one should at least be a tier two level word to establish that academic diction and this student crushed it. They went reverent and lauding. So automatically out of the gate, they got that academic flair going and they've crushed it. It's like that's the, that they've ascertained the correct meaning of what uh, is going on uh, in the passage. So we're going to sprinkle in the three most salient terms. So we got tone. Let's move on. Juxtaposing her character to the wisdom of the likes of Marcus Aurelius and Dr. Samuel Johnson. Claudia Johnson suggests that Roosevelt was perhaps one of the most important American figures of all time. So we got the illusion. That's really important to this piece. Extending her influence internationally across so many lines of division, Roosevelt was a powerhouse who refused to cede to silence. Instead, she was a champion of the people with unflinching principles. So you got what is the authorial intent? How does the author construct meaning? You got your three terms in here. The third one's implied ethos. Uh, take a look at the vocab. You know, it's up there, but the kid doesn't sound like a goon. They're not contrived. They're not pretentious. They're in their wheelhouse, but it's definitely got an academic flair. Look at the sentence constructs. This has nice voice rhythm flow. Like it's very supple, very flowy, right? So it's all there. This is the hundred and the kids who can break it down, talk about it. I don't really guide the conversation all that much. I want the students to figure it out. So we compare this, which is the $100, to this. To this very day, hate surrounds us. It was no different in the 20th century with segregation and rampant wars prevalent. So immediately we see that this is not declaring at all. It's, it's inverting, right? And this is fine. I know that a lot of you out in YouTube land will have your students approach it this way. But ultimately, I want my kids to have a conversation. Which is better? Which is more purposeful? Which is more deliberate? You know, which is going to rock out on the rubric? So let's see where this goes. You know, typically, I don't want my students to start vague like this. You know, to this very day, hate surrounds us. What, how is that germane? to the speech you know like what does that have to do is this seems sort of like a blanketed comment and it sort of pussyfoots around a thesis i want my guys to get in you got you know you got you know three essays to write in two hours so let's see where this goes citizens of all nations were being left behind in rubble and despair while others turned their back on the commitments they had made to the world around them however a beacon of hope was found in america lit by the contributions of Eleanor Roosevelt. So my kids would, you know, look at this and, and, and compare it to the hundred and just note the differences between this. And this is actually a college board sample. So it's taking a long time to articulate the argument here, to articulate the thesis. And um, I'm not a big fan of the inverted uh, for, for this reason. It tends to get plot heavy, it's summative. Um, it dodges the thesis. We really haven't got to authorial intent. We haven't got to the construction of meaning. And we're four sentences in. So this is kind of breathy. This is why Claudia Johnson, a fellow first lady herself, uses her prowess as a political figure to emphasize the contributions of Eleanor Roosevelt. Through alluding to great quotes, she felt embodied the spirit of Eleanor Roosevelt and by utilizing her perspective of having known Eleanor personally and admiring her to encourage women to act in similar ways of Eleanor Roosevelt. So you got to the authorial intent and the construction of meaning is, is implied in a couple of instances. Like we got the illusion, we got the ethos, uh, and that's about as far as that goes. Uh, the vocab is nice. The sentence structures are, are pretty decent uh, in here. 
And ultimately, it gets the thesis point, right? We have the same conversations with the kids. Which is better, the first one or the second one? And ultimately, we're going to have a conversation about $100, $90, $80, $70. And then we compare it to this. In her speech, Claudia Ladybird Johnson's reverent and motivational tone encourages her audience to continue Eleanor Roosevelt's legacy by being courageous and speaking for what is right. So this kid's declaring, right? They're using, they're using my template. So they got the tone. This student started the exact same way as the first, which is a better sentence, number one or number three. So then they're, they're going to transition here through pronouns. Johnson juxtaposes the citizens we and Roosevelt's she to prove how significant Roosevelt's everlasting contributions were to society. Additionally, a juxtaposition of the Holocaust to her ideals show the importance of being bold and speaking out for courage. Finally, through her syntactical features, particularly in aphora and enumeration, Johnson implores her audience to realize that rather than praising Roosevelt's achievements, the best way to honor her is to carry out her legacy of bravery and integrity. So clearly one's better. I want my, ha I want my, ki my kids to have a conversation to break down you know, at the like, word level, at the compositional level, what separates one from three. Right. And then when you deviate from the template with regards to like number two, what happens? What's the difference? So ultimately we're getting at, you know, the kids are going are, 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 are going to calibrate kind of like what, you know, AP, you know, readers do, um, you know, at the when they when they grade the exam and figure out, you know, what's the hundred, what's the 90, what's the 80, what's the 70. And uh, for each component of my template, I give my students a check, right? So I, they have a check for the introduction and I want them to score themselves. All too often, we wield all the power in grading. We assign the grade, that's the final word, it is what it is, right? I hand that over, I don't, I don't want that responsibility. So with regards to the introduction, I say, Write yourself a check. What grade are you, do you think you deserve? And then on my, on my check, uh, the big thing is why. The student needs to know the why, and that's where the learning happens. Often with traditional grading, the students don't know the why of our comments. They don't know why they are getting that grade, and it feels very arbitrary to them. So, you know, with the third example that we looked at, you know, the student might say, you know, it's 80 because, you know, um, uh, my sentences are parallel and um, uh, I kind of have a misread. I'm wordy. My vocab's low. Uh, whatever, you know, have, have, have them see it instead of us seeing it because that's kind of the divide there. We see as teachers, but do students see? They have to see. So we go through the whole template like that. We'll break down first premises, uh, second premises, uh, the whole line of reasoning together. And in the end, I have my students do this. One big blank check. Give yourself a grade. Tell me why. And I say in exactly five sentences, tell me why you think you deserve that grade. And the kicker, the big thing give me three learning targets. What's three things you're going to do to make this draft better if you choose to rewrite it or three things that you're going to do on your next subsequent essay um, or paper. And that's how learning happens, right? You have to know um, what you don't know. And then what I do is I look at these checks and on my blank piece of paper, I wrote down the, the grade I would give it. And I tell my students that we have to be within five points of each other. So let's say Jason said 88 and I said 91. I'll give him the higher grade, right? If we're more than five points off, then I like to have a conversation with the kid. And what might surprise you is that kids really aren't grade grubbers for the most part. I got a few, you know, some AP kids care more about grades than, uh, than learning. But typically, if we're more than five points off, it's because the kid is being harder on himself or herself than, uh, than I am. And uh, that's pretty cool to see. 
So this is um, a really unique way to uh, you know put the onus back on the kid and liberate us from some of the power and, and, and some of the responsibilities that the traditional method uh, of grading imposes upon us. So um, yeah, give it a shot. And uh, if you want uh, um, my checks that I use, uh, feel free. You can email me at teachingwritingcoach at gmail.com and uh, I can send those off. It's probably, you know, I, I, I'm actually thinking, you know, you probably want to make your own so that you're, you're, you know, you're, you're giving the kids the focus of what you want to um, draw attention to that particular uh, draft. So, um, you know, if you're working on line of reasoning, you know, you might want to, you know, during your writing workshop, exclusively focus on that. Or if you're focusing on first premises, or um, sentence constructs, you know, uh, just, you know, create your own checks. The big thing is to have the why. They have to be able to explain it. So I got a couple irons in the fire, as you guys know. Um, and one is I am going to sit down uh, this summer and write my textbook finally on my alternative grading method. So I'm going to compile 40 and um, get rolling on that. I am doing some uh, some webinars and a number of teachers asked me to resurrect something that I did well over a year ago and I and I and I kind of forgot about it. We did a two hour intensive on the alternative grading methods where we met I think it was like a Saturday morning and I went over the templates and then went over like uh, my top 10 favorite alternatives to uh, um, uh, alternative grade or uh, to traditional grading. So um, I have a number of teachers that asked me to do that and that's coming. We have to settle upon a date. But if you want more information on that, I'll, I'll let the Facebook groups know when we settle upon a date. But if you want to reserve a spot, uh, you can email me. Uh, there's my web page. You can get more information about it there. We're going to update that shortly. So teachinghowtowrite.com or teachingwritingcoach at gmail.com. So, all right, hopefully uh, this alleviates some of your uh, headache and hassle as far as uh, grading goes. And uh, reach out if you have any questions. So give it a whirl and see what happens. So for now, happy grading, happy teaching, happy writing.